as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And may we not be led into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Debbie to come and let's stand as we hear the sounds of the shofar drawing us to worship and Johannes as well. Thank you.
But I started to dwell on that, that we cannot be his children unless we become like one. And he has said, unless you become like a little child, you will not even see the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. And he repeated by saying, unless you become like children, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And it really spoke to me so deeply, because we think, you know, we have to try this and try that, and think this and think that. And, but just to, to be his child. Mm -hmm. And God is love. His essence is love. So here we are. You're all love, like you said. I thought I would tie in with what you said. Anyone else with a word? This is the family. We're together in this place. We call it God's house. He says that I can't be housed in buildings made with hands. For he is, of course, in all places at all times, but he has made his abode in our hearts and our lives. And I think of the Holy Spirit, how he dwells within. He's the deposit of everything that is to come. You know, we think about the new heavens and the new earth, the new creation, and already that started in our hearts. If anyone be in Messiah, that person is a new creation. Amen. The old is gone, the new has come. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes, Robert. Yeah, I just want to, after this last song, where you're just lift, lifting our voice to the Lord, I just felt the Lord speak to me that He wants to hear more from us, more praise, more worship, Amen. worship flowing from our heart and from our mind, and that we lift up our praises unto the Lord, and He will fall down upon us and fill us up and bring this tingling of the Holy Ghost oh, right from head to toe, healing and comfort and joy. It's such a delight to be able to lift our hands, lift our spirit, and worship the Lord. Amen. Amen. It's so awesome. So awesome. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. This morning. For this yes, your hands. I confirmed the same one. There. I was hearing the same thing. I was not going to say a word, but now that it came out, yes. He wants us to give praise and glory to him. Hallelujah. We should. Praise the Lord. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, in heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. As I was waiting on the Lord, he was pointing me over here, and I, I, looked, I tried to get Samuel's eye. No, but it was Elizabeth. While we were worshiping, I heard the voice say, no one, no one come to me every time they say me. Okay. Meant that everyone who come to trouble, whatever you have in your heart, whatever you speak to God, he will give you answer. Mm -hmm. I just believe that God has answered your prayer. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and, yes, meet and greet one another, but also inquire, is there anything I can pray concerning in your life. No, don't be nosy. <laughs> but at the same time, ask. And if you really uh, would like prayer, uh, seek out the brothers and sisters to pray for you. We'll take some time for this today. So let's then meet and greet one another and also ask, what can I, how can I pray for you today?
Baptist Church, 
on Duty Trunk Road in Coquitlam at 11 a.m. Also, uh, the ladies of French Baptist Church are going to provide the main meal or the main luncheon, but they are requesting if our, if our households from Shabbat Shalom could bring desserts for next week's, next morning, next uh, the memorial service. So, uh, if from our church, our congregation, if we could bring desserts, and the Friendship Baptist Church will provide the main luncheon. So they're requesting desserts from our congregation. And Purim has been moved, uh, well, Purim doesn't move, but we've moved our, our celebration to March 11th, uh, and that'll be a bring and bless here, but that's uh, a little bit later, in a few weeks. So just keep that in mind. And uh, let's pray for these children. Heavenly Father, in the name of Yeshua, we pray for these children, boys and girls, young, young men and women that are coming up here, Lord. We pray your blessing on them and make them a blessing to others as well. We pray in the name of Yeshua. Amen. 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 Let's go downstairs! Amen. In our parasha reading of this week, we come out of the uh, Exodus 19 and 20, where we're into the Ten Commandments. We talked about that last week. And by the end of Exodus 23, <coughs> There are the introduction of the feasts where the uh, children of Israel were to make sure that they gathered um, each year for three major feasts. Of course, there were seven, but three that they were to gather together. And in between that are a number of instructions, we call them laws and so on, but instructions of how to live. And I don't believe that these things are just, you know, written haphazardly, arbitrarily, that God said, well, I need to do a few filler verses here, so we're going to put some laws here in between these things. I believe that there's a reason why these verses come where they do between the Ten Commandments and the commandment to gather for the feasts of the Lord. When we think about how our what our faith looks like, uh, coming out of the Reformation, the congregations of Yeshua realized that they were saved by grace, saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to the scriptures alone, to the glory of God alone. Those are called the five solas. Grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, scriptures alone, to the glory of God alone. And the congregation, the believers, came out of that with an understanding or a desire for purity of knowledge, purity of doctrine, purity of what really is to be believed. And we became a very much a believing community in certain things, tenets of the faith. But just as grace is not alone, but it produces repentance and faith, and faith is not alone for it produces good works, so our belief should not just be set alone, set by itself. Belief must affect behavior. If you were to plant an apple tree in the back 40, or whatever you have, we have just a posted stamp in our, in our strata, that's our, that's our yard, and they even mow that for us of all things. But, if you were to plant an apple tree, what would you expect that tree to produce? Cherries. <laughs> Apples. Work with me. <laughs> a cherry tree. What would you expect? When we lived in Victoria, we um, I, I always wanted to have a cherry tree. I, I grew up on prairies, of course. We couldn't have fruit trees there because of the weather. And I always wanted a cherry tree. No one told me, though, that you can't plant a cherry tree. Well, you can but it's not a good idea to plant a cherry tree where there's a forest because all the varmints from the forest just love to eat our cherries. 
And Marty even tried to grow some strawberries. And I remember watching her fight with a squirrel over those strawberries. It was the strawberries that she was trying to mature. And the squirrel would take a bite out of one and then throw it away and take out a bite out of another. It irritated Marty to no end. If you, if you plant a peach tree, you'll expect peaches. And if you plant a lemon tree, you'll get lemons and at least can make lemonade from that. Yeah, amen. But the Word of God tells us that the things that we believe will affect our behavior. There will be an outcropping. There will be uh, that flow from where we are in our belief to how we act in our works, in our stewardship in our resources. And so we have here in Exodus uh, 22 through 23, certain principles. And I, I look at it and I see the social responsibility of believers. I know that in our faith, we, we are very much concerned about that we are saved only by faith, by grace through faith, and not of works, lest anyone should boast. And yet there are obviously changes in our life that will occur because we have believed. And so we come across these various instructions in the Torah. And one of these is the law concerning rest restitution in cases of theft. In case you happen to steal something. I don't know who exactly he's talking about. I can't imagine anyone here, but in case there's a, someone that steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it and sells it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. This is a command against theft. There is a principle, of course, love your neighbor as yourself. It's not a good thing to steal from one another, is it? And here are specific principles of how to deal with that within the community. And you may think, well, this doesn't have to do with me. I'm not a thief. I remember when well, at one service uh, back in St. Norbert, and we chose as a hymn that day, uh, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And I heard one lady in the front pew said, I'm not a wretch. <laughs> well, you know, when we think about the things that we say and do, you know, there can be weaknesses in our lives. And so we need to have these principles in place. It's interesting that the Mosaic Law did not really send a lot of people to jail. Did you realize that, that in all the things that, that, um, that they were told not to do, that not very often, there were cities of refuge if there, were, if there was a killing by accident. But otherwise, there wasn't a lot of jail time in the Torah. Rather, there was restitution. In fact, they wanted them to keep working so they could work off their debts and their trespasses. It's interesting that um, there were two churches that wanted to see if they could merge. And one had in their Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And the other would pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And, be, and they couldn't agree on, on which uh, form of the Lord's Prayer they would use. And so one church went back to its debts, and the other church went back to its trespasses. <laughs> but here we have the restitution that is required. The principle that is ignored often in Christians, in, in believers. We need to be true and have integrity in our lives. Where we have wronged someone, there needs to be that making things right. It's called restitution. And so we have this principle that there is a social responsibility. And here are the, in the Torah, the law of responsibility, verses 5 to 8 of Exodus 22. If a man causes a field or a vineyard to be grazed, and lets loose his animal and it feeds in another man's field, he shall make restitution from the best of his own field and the best of his own vineyard. If fire breaks out and catches in thorns, so that stacked grain, standing grain, or the field is consumed, he who kindled the fire shall surely make restitution. 
If a man delivers his neighbor money or articles to keep and is stolen out of the man's house, if the thief is found, he shall pay double. If the thief is not found, then the master of the house shall be brought to the judges to see whether he has put his hand into his neighbor's goods. Responsibility. You know, it's interesting that um, when we were coming into Torah and uh, some in you know, the church said, oh, these things don't apply to us. You know, the, the God, has, God has done away with the Torah, even though Yeshua said that he did not come to abolish the Torah, but to bring it to fullness. And it's interesting that when it comes to these things, it's how convenient, how convenient it is to say, oh, these things don't apply. I believe that they do. I believe that there is things to do that we should be righteous in our action, in our social responsibility. Even where there's no intent to do harm, we need to be careful of one another and how we look out for each other. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. There was a fellow in our congregation in, back in Winnipeg, and he would always quote these things, and he would say, do unto others as they have done unto you. <laughs> Did you catch that? <laughs> and he, he always kind of had it a little bit, uh, just a little bit off. No, we are to do unto others as we would have them do unto you. I remember leading a Bible study, and there was one fellow there that um, he was participating in some known sin. It was quite open. And I, I called him on it, and I said, you know, really, you shouldn't be doing that. And he said, oh, we're under grace. And he said, you know, there's only two laws now. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And he thought that that meant just a kind of an emotional uh, feeling kind of love. That I love God. I love my neighbor. He loved his neighbor a little too much. But anyway, um, that was, you know, and then he said, that's, that's all I'm, that's required. And I said, well, but what does that look like? What does loving God look like? How do you, how do you work that out in day-to-day -day life? And he said, no, we're not under law. And he, he didn't even believe that he was under the Ten Commandments. Well, how we need to be careful that, you know, grace is not grease. <laughs> grace is not just gravy to, over our mistakes. Grace is the power to do according to his good purpose and will in us. Grace is a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful power of God that changes us from glory to glory. And it changes our behavior. There are instructions regarding ownership and borrowing. Uh, it's not necessarily a good thing to borrow, but sometimes we do. And if the thing that we borrowed is damaged while it's under our care, there were laws, there were instructions regarding replacing that. Um, you know, uh, I, I don't know if I dare go here. Um, shopping carts in parking lots. Um, well, parking lots in general. Uh, you know, there's dings and things that happen. And do we always, and I, you know, I'm not here to judge, but do we always make that note and put it on the windshield? I know that I've heard of this, that people will write out a note just because they think people are watching it, the note really says nothing. But they think that they're in, in case someone's watching. We need to be careful in our, in our dealings with people. I heard just this week that if someone doesn't like you because of your faith in Yeshua, in Jesus, that's not your problem. But if someone doesn't like Jesus because of you, that's a problem. Yes, yes, Did you catch that? Yes, yes, yes. If someone doesn't like you because of your faith in Yeshua, don't worry about that. Yeshua said people will hate you. But if people hate Yeshua because of the things they see in you, that's a problem. We need to be careful in our dealings, in our responsibility. And so there are principles regarding borrowing and lending. If the person, say you borrow something or someone brings along a tool and you're working on it together, that person is there. The Bible even deals with this. The, uh, the person is there, and even if you're using the tool, they're responsible because they are right there to see how you're using it. 
If they're not there, it's your responsibility, and so on. The scriptures are so interesting that they deal with so many details of life. And even in morality, the moral and ceremonial laws. And it talks about in uh, Exodus 22, verses 16 and 17, if a man entices a virgin who is not betrothed, and lies with her, he shall surely pray, pay the bride price for her to be his wife. If her father utterly refuses to give her to him, he shall pay money according to the bride price of the virgins. There was a cost to uh, sexual morality. There was no such thing allowed as casual sex. That there was a cost. There was a bride price. The dowry had to be paid. And if the father said, I'm, I'm not interested in having you as a son-in-law, but you still have to pay the bride price because of what has happened to my daughter. There was respect in families and protection. You know, it just, our, our society is, has lived so far from this where even parents are saying, well, you know, they'll do it anyway. And so they even provide opportunities for their children. And children are going from partner to partner to partner to partner without the respect and understanding that there is responsibility for these relationships. The scriptures are pertinent, are relevant for today. Amen. Amen. Morality. And we need, you know, people will think that, oh, you're so old-fashioned. Oh, you, you know the church, oh, yeah, it has all these rules. Well, no, it, the scriptures is the one with the guidance. It's God's concerning. He is the one that uh, gives life, and so we need to be careful in all of these things. There are areas of pharmaceuticals, of sorcery, of idolatry. Three capital crimes are listed in verses 18 to 20 of Exodus 22. You shall not permit a sorceress to live. Whoever lies with an animal shall surely be put to death. He who sacrifices to any god except to Yodhevave, he shall be utterly destroyed. These were horrific crimes in the culture of the Canaanite culture that they were going to uh, go into. And the ways in which they worshipped false gods was horrendous, even bestiality and things that we can't even begin to imagine, except that we live in this day and age. You know, we, we don't necessarily think about Moloch and Baal and Ash, Ashtora. We don't think of those. But there's other things in our society, pharmaceuticals that are not proper narcotics and things. Uh, things that cause hallucinations and whatnot. These things are prevalent in our society. And shame on a government, shame on a government would say, these things now can be legal. Shame on a government that gives up on people and says, we have no answer for you. We are going to let you do whatever you want and it's your life. We need to care. That's not loving our neighbor as ourselves. We need to care for those that are caught up in these activities. Even though they don't know about Moloch and Baal and Ashtoreth, these are the very things, the very same gods that are active, or false gods, I should say, that are active in our world today. And we have a responsibility to hold up the standard of the gospel and say, no, these things cannot be and should not be uh, practiced in our land. How we need to stand up for what's right again. You know, the United States enjoyed several awakenings, the first, second, and third great awakening, and it changed people. It made them into a godly nation, and sure, there were still problems, but there was a godliness. It was founded on godly principles. Even Canada itself was founded on godly principles, the verse that is in the archway of the Peace Tower in Ottawa. Do you know what the verse says? He shall have dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. And it's right there. I'm not sure if Justin uses that entry. I shouldn't name the ends, but anyway. 
Uh, I'm not sure if they use that entrance, but it's right there in the center block in the archway. I guess that building is under, uh, under renovation right now. So they need to get back to that. He shall have dominion. This is God's dominion. Oh, we need to get back to these social responsibilities. You know, when we, when we look at the things that the scripture lists regarding the sexual sins and the sins of the uh, narcotics and so on, and the bestiality and whatnot, it harkens back to the days of Noah. What did Yeshua say? As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be before the Son of Man comes. And it harkens back to those days of Noah. Do you remember what the Bible says was one of the main things, main causes for the flood to happen? That the sons of God, these watchers, these angelic uh, fallen angels, the fallen ones, went into the daughters of men, and then there were giants in the earth, there were evil mixed relations, things that ought not to be. And we are seeing more and more of these things in our day, things that we couldn't even imagine. They can't even tell what a gender is. They don't know. So there are parents that are having children and they say, we don't know what we have because we don't know yet. That child has yet to tell us what they are. There are little children going to kindergarten and they are being asked, even though they barely know their colors and things, they are being asked, and what is your preferred pronoun? And those little five, four and five year olds, what's a pronoun? <laughs> so they don't even know these things and they're being asked these because they can't use the wrong pronoun uh, on a child and these children don't know. I read this week of a testimony of a lady. She said when she was growing up, she was a tomboy. She liked to do uh, boyish things. And uh, she enjoyed, you know, she would rather play in the dirt and do the things on the farm that uh, the boys did rather than go and play with dolls and things. And she said, I'm so glad I didn't grow up today. Because she said, I would never have all the children that God has given me. She said, I love being a mom. But she said, if I'd have grown up, what I did back then, if I'd have grown up today, they would have changed me into something else. And you know what? It, it's, it's horrific. Because it's only pretend. Talk about strange, a strange time where people can live in a pretend world and have all these horrific things done to their bodies and lose the, their fertility in things and then come out with an appearance of something, but not really that thing. Oh, here we are, the days of Noah. Oh, amen. Here we are. Now, Exodus, and, and if you think that, that the laws of God do not pertain today, you read it over again and see that it does. Uh, Exodus uh, 22, verses 21 to 24, compassion for the stranger and disadvantaged. You shall neither mistreat a stranger nor oppress him, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I want to ask you a question. When the uh, family of Joseph, family of Jacob, went to Egypt, on what basis did they did they go down to Egypt? On, on whose word, on whose command, or on whose invitation did they go down to Egypt? Pharaoh extended the invitation. They didn't, Joseph didn't just show up with all his, his kin and say, well, we're here, feed us, <laughs> or do this for us. No, they came by invitation. There was a proper way. You know, sometimes people say, well, you know, everybody that came to these shores, uh, no, no, one, no one allowed that, no one asked. But there is a way to come. There is a way to come into our nations legally and, will, and with great open arms and with great welcome, there is a way to come into our nation. But just showing up and saying, we're here, that's not it. We are, yes, we're to be kind to the stranger, but the stranger needs to be kind to the people that they are coming in. And, and receiving blessing from. It goes both ways. 
But there is responsibility to be kind to the stranger, compassion for the weak and the vulnerable. You shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. How do we treat the most vulnerable in our society? Part of the problem in our social thinking is that we just kind of throw money and programs at things. And we don't get to the root of the problem. What caused the people to come to that place in their lives? We need to look at what caused the problems and deal with the root causes and not just put band-aid solutions on things which are no solutions at all. It's not compassionate to leave someone in their problems and with their problems. It's not compassion to say, well, you've got a drug problem, so we'll just make drugs legal. That's not compassion. We need to come there and say, how can we bring you a solution? How can we bring you victory? The church doesn't speak about victory much anymore. We don't speak much about the strength and the anointing of our gospel much anymore. Because I wonder if the power, you know, we have a form, the Bible says we have a form of godliness, but we lack the power thereof. How we need power again. How we need to know that what we believe, we also act upon. And then there's compassion for the poor, verses 25 to 27. If you lend money to any of my people who are poor among you, you shall not be like a money lender to her. You shall not charge him interest. And the word for interest in the Hebrew is biting or devouring interest. Uh, how we need to, uh, you know, look at that in these days. You know, our, our society, our governments are not doing what they could do to help people really through the problems of this time. And you really begin to wonder, and I don't want to you know, promote any theories here or anything, but you begin to wonder you know, whose side are these people on? How we need to be careful in all that we do and say and act. And then there are other laws regarding our holiness, holy living, and to give God all that is due the firstborn was always regarded as the best, and there was, a, there was an offering to be given in, in lieu of the firstborn, but to re, be reminded that we belong to God. Israel is his firstborn, his favorite people. When we think about how God has redeemed us, has ransomed us, has brought us out, and has set, our, set us in freedom, what is there that we would not want to do for this great and awesome God? How we want to serve Him. Remember, yes, love your neighbor as yourself, but remember first, the first commandment is what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. How much does God want? How much does God want from us? Well, that's, maybe we can percentage it out, you know, that parcel it out a little bit. You know, when, when we think about our lives being like a house and we receive Yeshua into our lives and we say to Yeshua, welcome, um, here's your room, Here, here's, the, here's a special guest room for you, this is where you can stay, please don't look into the hall closet. <laughs> You know, I've got stuff in there I don't want. And, and you, can, you can have part. Does Yeshua come into our lives to reside in part of our lives? No. He's Lord of all or not Lord at all. How we need to give ourselves completely to God. All our heart, all our strength, all our mind. Hallelujah. And so there's all of these areas that we need to look at and realize that if this gospel has any value at all, this gospel has got to have a value of changing us from glory to glory and in real ways, in tangible ways. And that's what these laws concern. It promotes kindness and civil conduct 
and all kinds of things. Don't you know? Don't take a bribe. We should, you know. Sometimes I, I had one uh, one leader in a church ask me, "Why does God have to tell me what to, uh, anybody would know this?" Well, you know, isn't this like God? I know you know this, but you need a reminder. <laughs> and how we need to be reminded of what God's purpose is. And then God goes on in His law, in His Torah, to tell us about the law of the sabbatical year. There is a stewardship that we have in this world, in this environment. Now, taking care of the environment, taking care of this world, does not mean that we worship this world. It does not mean that we worship the climate. It does not mean that we worship the environment. We are to take care of this world as good stewards. When Adam was sent into the garden with Eve, they were to tend the garden. But the garden was not to become an idol for them. They were to eat of every tree of the, uh, in the garden except for the tree of knowledge of good and evil but it was all there for them otherwise. When we are thinking about the stewardship we have, the scripture gives us these principles of a Sabbath year. The land was to remain uh, fallow on every seventh year. Why did the Israelites, why were the Israelites sent into exile, into Babylon? What was the reason? They didn't keep the Sabbath years, and the land had to have 70 years of rest because they didn't take care of and, and be good stewards of the land that God had given them. Social responsibility, the things that the gospel has, you know, these are relevant to the gospel. We say that we believe, we say that we love the Lord, but will we do the things that God asks of us to do for him and through, and through him through us? It's interesting that after all of these different um, instructions and principles, laws that God gives, then in chapter 23 and verses 14 to 17, uh, Exodus 23, 14 to 17. Then he talks about the national feasts. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread uh, at the time of Passover, and you shall keep the feast of harvest, Shavuot, and you shall keep the feast of ingathering, Sukkot. Three times a year they were to gather together as a whole congregation. It's interesting that God gives all of these very practical social, um, you know, responsible things that they are to do to take care of each other and do all the things, make sure that they're, they're being a good community. And then he says, now here are the times that you are to gather together in worship. What do we do in our gospel churches? We say, come to worship. And then next week, come to worship. And then next week, come to worship. And what have we done in between, in the days between? You see, here we have all the things that we are to do, the, the responsibilities that we are to engage in, and then we come to worship. Otherwise, we're hypocrites. Otherwise, we're coming to worship if we have not done the things for our neighbor. How can you say you love God if you have not loved the brother who you, you know, the God that you cannot see, how can you love God that you cannot see if you have not loved the brother whom you can see? Yeah, I believe that this is on purpose, that God puts these in this order. Here's all the things that you should do to show that you are gospel people. We are not saved by our works. And, we, and you know what? The people of Israel never were saved by their works. When Paul says, uh, by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified, that wasn't a new thing. He was explaining by his teaching what the Torah actually was about. That by the works of the law, no flesh is justified. But when we are, obey, are obeying, the law, obeying the Torah, it shows that we are 
justify. It shows that we are in relationship to God. And then God says, now come and gather and be part of the worship of God. Because then we come, having done the things that we, within our power, within our ability to do, and then we come to do the amazing spiritual thing in the body of believers. I have one quote here, and I want you to think about it. Don't come to church from the field unless you've been church in the field. Do you get that? Don't come to church from the field unless you've been church in the field. Be the body in the world. Be who you should be in Yeshua, out there in our relationships with everyone. Be Yeshua in the field. And then come and worship Yeshua with the body of believers. And that's the order that's given in these verses, in this parish our reading. And so I want us to be encouraged today that God has done a work in our lives, that we have been saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to the scriptures alone, to the glory of God alone, but it's not alone. It has all these wonderful blessings that we can be an empowerment, the grace of empowerment in our lives to be Yeshua in the world. And that is what stewardship is. That is what social responsibility is. That is real social justice. When we are out there being the hands and feet of Yeshua and being the love of God within the world that he's set us. And so here we are, blessed of God, and let our faith not just be a, a bunch of boxes that we tick, that we say, well, I believe this, I believe this, I believe this, I believe this. You know, if you just have a faith where it's ticking off boxes, guess who else could tick off all those boxes? Do you believe in God? Good for you. So does who else? What does the Bible say? Do you believe in God? Great. So do the demons. <laughs> and they, at least they tremble. <laughs> it's not just ticking off boxes. It's actually being Yeshua. Be Yeshua in the field. And then come and worship Yeshua in the body of believers. Amen. 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 It's a tough sermon. <laughs> but praise God. Let's, uh, this one needs to be midrashed. This needs to be worked over. Uh, so let's take some time in a, in a time of midrash as we think about our responsibility in this world and the things that uh, we need to be as a testimony to those around us. Anyone that would like to start? Debbie. I was wanting to sing Ice High because because that's the way you were talking about it in your teaching. Aitz Chaim hi lamachazim ba vetom heya meushar terachia kacheno vet tivotea shalom hashive. Chadesh Yamenu Keketem Chadesh Chadesh Yamenu Keketem Now in English The Torah is a tree of life Blessed are those who hold fast to it All of its ways are pleasantness and all its paths are peace Return us to you Adonai Renew our days as of old This is, it's, it's an interesting um, message, isn't it, from the Torah and how we respond in our in our day to day lives. Anna. 
<laughs> I was a bit shocked this week with uh, my children, two of my children. I was referring to the cancer who had a girlfriend. And I told them that um, I got a real good response from this grandson um, he, who has a girlfriend and lives in Toronto. And it came out of their mouth, two different of my children, that, oh, they live together. And I was stunned. I said, yeah, but they asked me to pray for them. And I prayed that they stay pure. But mom, that's what they do. I am flabbergasted. The younger generation. Is that what you were talking about? You know that we're losing the value of the gospel. The gospel is not there anymore. And that is why I cry out for the Lord. And, and I want to um, say, try to get that video that Merla and Merle sent me about this uh, harp concept in Jerusalem. It almost brings you in heaven. It's, it's so encouraging, it's so beautiful. Like Brenda, I sent it to Brenda and she said, I started to dance and it's quite something for the Brenda to dance. So anyways, that is behind this negative thing I want to rejoice. It's, um, these things are relevant, real in our lives. And to go back and to say, well, we're going to live biblically, that's not easy because our world has just slid way past that. But that doesn't mean that we slide with the world. Amen. Anyone else? Something. Sure. I felt like to say that that they live together is a form of judging. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say that they live together. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But they expect it. I think mm -hmm. it's judging and that's not helping them. Mm -hmm. We need to pray. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. 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 I get lots of emails. So today I was on with Odessa and Edmund, I believe his name was, and he was warning us about all the things that these um, smart cities and the lead lights and what's out there. And people die for lack of knowledge. And we are ambassadors. We're not warriors. Warriors wear army gear. David did not wear army gear. He couldn't. He was an ambassador. If he'd spit on Goliath, Goliath would have fell over. So we need to know how to fight, but fight God's way. And we know we don't fight flesh and blood. But we have to act. Because the younger generations are younger than we are. And the older generations are older than some of us are. So we fight. The, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes. <coughs> I'm new here and I've already spoken now my second time, but I just want to offer a little bit of insight into what works of law possibly means. Because, you know, Rob Shaul, Paul, was, um, he was a rabbinical student. Um, and that never changed. After he met Yeshua, he was still a rabbinical student. And he was a student of Gamaliel, who was the grandson of Hillel. So around Yeshua's time, there were two main houses of rabbis. There was Shema and Hillel. And the, and the Pharisees, the Parashim. So, 
Works of the law in Hebrew is Miskat Ma'aseh HaTorah. There's actually a document by that name. And it, it was found in a Qumran cave, and the, um, the people who dug it up call it 4QMMT. You can actually find this document. It's a letter between rabbis of different sects, because we know they had the Essenes, and they had the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And so it was a letter between rabbis of different sects about specific practices, traditions, right? Because we know that they had the Takanot, the Gerizot, and the, uh, the Maasim. These are different traditions. These are added to the law. Works of the law very possibly means the traditions, the rituals you go and that you follow to become a member of the nation. Because I've read Tractate Karim in Talmud, and it is the steps of conversion that was traditionally followed at that time. The process now to become a member, because we know from Romans 11, Galatians 3, Ephesians 2, that we are members of the nation through faith in Yeshua. And so really this was a discussion of following the traditions of conversion do not get you members in the kingdom. You're not justified by these traditions. You're justified through faith in Yeshua. Hopefully that will shed a little bit of light when, because when we discuss Torah with people from the mainstream church, they will bring up Galatians and Ephesians and, and all these books of Paul that they're misunderstanding. And the more we study these things and look at the traditions of the time, we can understand the context. In the context of uh, the quote unquote law, Sometimes it's talking about the instruction, and other times it's talking about legalism. And so Paul said that the law is holy. The law is good. The Torah, the instruction is holy and good. In fact, without the Torah, how would we know what is right or wrong? How would we know that we even needed a savior? Amen. And so we have this Torah as part of the gospel. It, you, there needs to be a recognition that law and grace, actually the law, the Torah, is a gracious thing. It's a gracious act of God to draw us, to corner us, to bring us to faith until we are cast upon Him by grace through faith. They do not work uh, against each other, but are, are with each other. They dovetail. Amen. Thank you, brother. Anyone else? Amen. Uh, Ron uh, was not feeling well uh, today, and so Ron and Janet are not with us uh, today. Uh, we, Lord, we pray for Ron and Janet, that she will be with them, raise them up again to health and strength. We pray in the name of Yeshua. We pray for Sandra. We ask, Lord, that you be with Sandra, with uh, Benjamin and David and Hannah in this time of grief, of bereavement. And Lord, next week as we come together, may we come with encouragement and comfort to that family in the name of Yeshua. And Lord, we pray for our land. God, keep our land glorious and free. Bring our land back. Bring Canada back to its foundations where you have dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would be with this country and with the United States, with the United Kingdom, with, with other believing or that were believing nations. Bring them back in revival, we pray, in the name of Yeshua. Amen and amen. Let's stand. us with the... I'm not prepared today. You're not prepared. Okay. All right. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give to you his shalom.